doesn't work. No. Okay. Uh, first of all, a couple of words about myself. My name is Harald Zettelhofer. Uh, I'm from Austria. Uh, I'm, I live, in, in, live and work in Linz. Uh, I work as a technology strategist for Dynatrace. Dynatrace is a company for uh, performance monitoring. Uh, my background is actually in database and web development for many years. Uh, with PHP, I have worked with more than 15 years now. And uh, in general, so not only for work, but also uh, what I'm doing in my, in my spare time, I love to discover new things. Uh, that's why, why my, one of my favorite uh, passions, my favorite hobbies, is going to the Austrian caves here and do caving explorations. Okay, but if we start talking about caves now, that might probably take too long. So uh, let's talk about how to run PHP fast on Nginx and some uh, tips and tricks for high performance websites. Uh, first of all, high performance websites. So what is performance about? Uh, we already heard a couple of things about that in uh, Marco's uh, keynote earlier today. Uh, he was mentioning that performance is more and more important because it's uh, even considered by search engine, engines. Google is already using website performance for uh, ranking uh, the page in the search results. And uh, it's planned that it's not only used for ranking, but there will be a, a mark uh, next to the to the search results, whether the website is, is slow or or performing, so performance is becoming more and more an issue. Um, not only back in these days when we had very easy configurations uh, running PHP on the LAMP stack, uh, but even back then performance was an issue. But the main uh, performance bottleneck back then was actually the part here where the user connected to the internet. You remember these days when we had the dial-up uh, connections to the internet. So uh, PHP or, or the database itself, maybe it was slow, but for sure our, our dial-up connection was definitely most times slower. Uh, well, times changed. Uh, applications become more and more uh, complex and the connection that we have from the user to the internet is most times faster now, but performance is uh, still, performance still matters, but actually uh, through the, the full stack. So really from the user all the way through the browser, web server, application down to the database and back. Um, well, times are changing a little bit again, so we are moving away from these classical monolithic applications, more to microservice environments, uh, cloud architectures, but still performance matters, performance is an, is an issue, but uh, we have maybe different bottlenecks, different hotspots, different things to consider here. Uh, especially in, in these days where we are using uh, scalable environments in the cloud with different technologies, we hear a lot of times when we uh, see applications where performance problems occur that uh, the, the administrators or, or designers of the architecture say, oh, well, uh, let's scale up our, our application. Let's not just use five application servers here, scale up to maybe 50 application servers, and then we are ready for big traffic for lots of requests, and that would work, work out fine then. But the question is, is that really true? And uh, with a lot of examples where the architects suggested, okay, let's scale up here and use CDNs and whatever, we found out that the real performance problems actually were not the, the backend or PHP, the PHP engine, but one of the most important performance problems or hotspots that we have or that we keep finding is overloaded pages. So a lot of static content that has to be transferred to the clients has to be rendered there. And actually that's, that, that website is not a, a fake site for uh, an overloaded pages. Uh, an overloaded page. This site was really once out and uh, online, and it 
was back in 2008 when it even made it to the worst website of the year. Uh, by the way, this is still, there is still an archive available where this page can be found. And especially using browser tools like Firebug or Google Developer Tools, you can really uh, see how this page gets rendered. And it takes, I think, up to two minutes until it's fully rendered. Crazy. Well, it's not just that very bad page. Uh, page with lots of static content and, and uh, large assets are out there on a daily basis, especially with, uh, with online shops where a lot of graphics are, a lot of articles have to be rendered in, in article lists, a lot of design. Uh, as an example here, uh, a, a website where we found uh, 434 different resources and a total page size of 20 megabytes. And as you see, this is the landing page, uh, and, and this takes a while to be rendered. Uh, it's not really creating good user experience here. Uh, one of my favorites, uh, actually, this was the FIFA.com uh, website for the World Cup in 2014. And the largest as asset on that page was the FAV icon with 370 uh, kilobytes. Uh, just for this uh, small icon in the in the address uh, line, and and two more uh, contents here: uh, uh, a, a CSS in the JavaScript file resulted in more than 800 kilobytes just for the three files that had to be loaded for the for the landing page. Well, on the one hand, it's static content that can be easily cached in the browser and has don't has to be reloaded all the time. On the other hand, the first time it has to be loaded because it's it's not yet there. And especially once when it comes to caching, we have we have two different options. We have the static caching where the content is stored in the browser and always taken from there, uh, depending on the expiration of the of the file. On the other hand, we have this conditional caching when we use the entity tag. So when, we, uh, when, when the HTML requests a certain JavaScript or CSS or, or image file, uh, the browser sends a request to the web server uh, using that hash of the file. And the web server then checks whether the content has changed or not. If the content, if the hash is still the same and, and the browser decides the content has not changed, uh, changed, it just sends back a response header uh, with a, a special uh, response code. And then the browser knows I can take the content from the browser, uh, from the browser's cache. Yeah? Uh, so only the response header is sent back, no response body. But what that means is that all of these requests for cached content still create requests to the web server and have to be served there. And especially when we have a lot of content and a lot of requests to the web server, that slows down the entire application dramatically. So uh, what does that mean in a, in a classical environment where we are using Apache or let's use a LAMP stack, uh, Linux server, Apache, PHP module loaded in Apache and a database behind it? So the browser sends a request to the web server. Uh, Apache has to start a new process uh, because when, when we use PHP, uh, we cannot uh, uh, use Apache in the, in the threaded mode. We have to run it in the, in, with processes. And the HTML is created, sent back to the browser, and then for every single content that's there, uh, every single asset that's requested from the server, a new re web request is sent to Apache, and a new process has to be started because it's a new process. But that means that everything starting from the Apache core to the modules that are defined in Apache, like the mod PHP, has to be loaded and needs certain resources uh, in the operating system. Even for these requests that are cached, because we send 
the request to the web server. And even though we just sent back a response header and no response body, we have to create such a process on the web server. And especially for uh, environments with very high load, that consumes a lot of resources. So how could that be done better? Uh, if we use a web server like, uh, like Nginx, we don't have the Apache uh, PHP module available. We have to run PHP in an external process, in the fast process manager. Uh, however, this is also done, uh, it is also possible by uh, using Apache uh, to use a fast CGI module to forward the requests. Uh, there are uh, some implementations out there. Uh, I have not used it myself, but uh, the feedback that I got from, from different uh, people that have used it is don't use it in production environments or in, in high load production environments. So in, in that case, we get the web request in, send the uh, request for PHP to the external PHP engine, the fast process manager, and the HTML is sent back to the browser. And for every single other request that's coming in, so for the images, JavaScript, CSS files, these requests are handled uh, not by creating new threads or new processes on the web server, but uh, event-based in the worker processes uh, with Nginx. And that's quite uh, saving a lot of resources here. What do we need for that? On the one hand, as I just mentioned, we don't have the PHP module in Apache. We need the uh, fast process manager. That's available since PHP 5.3 and uh, available in a stable version since PHP 5.4. Uh, can be installed very easily, actually, uh, like, for instance, in a Debian or Ubuntu environment with apt-get install PHP 5 FPM. Then we can configure different run pools and specify how many child processes, how many worker processes should be created to serve the requests. And we can also define uh, the, the operating system user that uh, should be used for running these, these requests. Uh, and the next thing we have to define is uh, where that process uh, listens. So it could either be a, a TCP socket or it could be a Unix socket. Another option is uh, not to use the, the send engine, PHP fast process management, but for instance, uh, HHVM, uh, Facebook's uh, implementation of PHP, uh, done very in a very similar way. So on the one hand, uh, apt get install HHVM, and uh, then we have to start a server specifically uh, for a certain environment where our files are, and we just tell the server again where to listen, so either a TCP socket or, or a Unix socket. The next thing is Nginx. We need a web server. Uh, maybe uh, a couple of, uh, some, some background on Nginx itself. By the way, who is already using Nginx? Okay, quite a lot. Uh, for those ones who are not using it, uh, Nginx is a, is a very lightweight uh, web server, HTTP server. Originally, it was not actually designed as a, as a web server. The, the first intention when Igor Sysoev created it back in 2002 was to create a reverse proxy. Uh, Igor was working on projects for Apache back then, and uh, he had to solve the C10K problem to, so to handle 10,000 concurrent requests, and that was not possible with Apache, and so he decided to create his own uh, reverse proxy first to uh, solve these, these requests. And he started back in 2002, and the first version went on online in 2004. And since then, it has been uh, yeah, improved many, many times. Uh, right now, there's version 195 out there. It's still an open source project, BSD license, and yeah, 
very successful development. Nginx itself, uh, they have founded a, a company then in 2011. Uh, first intention was to uh, provide uh, enterprise support for the open source uh, web server. Uh, and then, in addition to that, they, they created a commercial product, Nginx Plus, which is a more sophisticated version of, of Nginx, especially for usage as load balancer, caching layer, so for uh, scaled environments. Nginx is already uh, the number one web server in the top 10,000 websites. Uh, so. Uh, Top 100,000, actually, meanwhile. Uh, so, and especially in the top 10,000, it's almost 50% of, of all sites are running Nginx, while Apache is already down to 31. And these numbers uh, keep changing again and again. So, these numbers are from October 2015. Um, the initial configuration is actually pretty easy. Uh, there are a couple of things to to be considered. On the one hand, the number of worker processes that are defined in the Nginx conf file uh, should match the number of CPU cores. So this is important that it really runs smoothly and, and can use the existing resources properly. Uh, another thing that I always add to the configuration is the PCRE JIT. Uh, this is actually a just-in-time compiler for the regex uh, configurations or for the uh, regex parts in the configuration file. Uh, we will see that later on, so regular expressions can be used in the, in the configuration files to uh, instruct Nginx what to do for certain web requests, but these uh, regular expressions are actually pretty slow. Uh, and by, by turning on the, the JIT for regex uh, that speeds up the, the entire process a lot. So worker connections is uh, set to 1024 by default. This can be left as it is and multi accept on, so uh, multiple connections can be accepted uh, at the same time. And then uh, a standard way to integrate Nginx and PHP here is, for instance, to define a server block, so uh, a server block in Nginx is similar to a virtual host in um, Apache. Uh, we de uh, define a port uh, where to listen, the server name, the root directory for our HTML or PHP project, uh, index also as we know from Apache, and then we have different location blocks, and these location blocks now are the configuration for uh, Nginx to tell when a web request for PHP is coming in, do that. If a request for uh, ending with uh, one of these uh, extensions, then do that. And uh, location root is more or less the default if no other uh, location block can be matched. In that case, we would serve uh, a static request for HTML, JavaScript, whatever. Uh, directly by drive files, uh, URI, so as the request came in, try it, and if not found, return a 404. If a request for PHP is coming in, then uh, add a couple of parameters here, so fast CGI index, index PHP, fast CGI pass uh, where to send the request to. Uh, actually, in that case, we are missing the, the port here, so we, it's not only IP address, but also uh, the port where the fast process manager is listening. And uh, the fast CGI params is a, is a default file that defines some additional values for the, for the communication. Uh, so fast CGI pass as it's here. Uh, IP address and, and port number. If you're using, if so if we uh, have FastGGI process manager running on Unix socket, we just pass it to the Unix socket. Uh, in general, for high performance, uh, again, if we have the fast process manager running on the same machine as Nginx is running, then Unix sockets are 
slightly faster than TCP sockets. Only for really high requests, high load, uh, when it would uh, actually consume too many file handles uh, in the file system, then uh, TCP sockets might be faster than, than Unix sockets. But that actually has to be checked out uh, in, in a specific project and, and tested properly. Once we have configured our environment like that uh, and we get web requests in, I have an example transaction flow here. So for 75 requests coming from the browser to Nginx, uh, only 14 of them are forwarded to the PHP engine. Uh, okay, 13 create a, a request to the database, but the other 61 requests that hit Nginx, that hit the web server, never hit the PHP engine. And therefore, uh, we save a lot of resources on the server. Uh, another cool functionality that we can use in, in Nginx uh, together with PHP, when we have uh, a requirement to uh, use a URL rewrite, like we have a, a URL, www.mysite.com, news browse 2014. Uh, the exercise here is uh, always forward the request to index PHP and use uh, the chunks here as parameters for, for our functionality. So typically in Apache, what we would do is uh, create rewrite rules to rewrite that to Nginx. If we translate that into Nginx configuration one-to-one, -one, it would be similar. So we have a, a default location block. We try the URL as it is. So we try to find a file with that name. We don't find it. We use the next option here. So the URI with the slash, so meaning it's a directory, then it automatically adds the what's defined here in the indexes. Again, we would not find it because news browse 2014 is no directory. Then it would hit the missing block. That's a named location for, uh, for that block. And here we would do a rewrite the web request to index PHP. We and in the execution, we see that the original web request was for news browse. Then we get a new web request for index PHP. And that finally is forwarded to PHP itself. So, but we have actually two web requests before, so the original one, then the, the rewrite, and then it hits the PHP engine. In Nginx, we can do it in a way that we always forward these requests to uh, PHP, so to have the fast CGI pass in the default location block and use the index PHP as our script file name. So that means we forward the web request with the URI uh, news browse 2014 to PHP, but automatically instruct the fast process manager to use index PHP as the, uh, the script file name. And therefore, we have one web request less. And actually, that increases our performance. Another thing, and we heard uh, I don't know who has uh, heard the last talk from, from Chris about uh, performance. Uh, he talked a lot of caching, and as especially in Nginx, we have some, some cool caching features out of the box here. And one is a fast CGI cache. So uh, in our fast CGI communication block, where we Nginx talks to the fast process manager, we can define a cache uh, with a named key here, and that app key is a name that's defined as a key zone in the fast CGI cache. Actually, that's a part, a reserved part in the file system uh, where we can, uh, on the one hand, use the out of the box configuration, or on the other hand, overwrite the logic how these cache files are created. And we can use the cache key here 
uh, to identify, so when a request comes in, to check the cache for the file. Uh, by default, we could use uh, the, the, the scheme request method host and request URI, but we could also add uh, cookie parameters here, for instance, to have user-specific uh, cache content. And for, so when a request comes in for one URI, we have cookie-specific uh, uh, parameters in our uh, caching key and therefore decide whether to use the, to use the content from there or not. Uh, I've created an example here. So it's a, it's a very basic uh, script, actually. Uh, PHP just uh, echo the time. Uh, without the fast CGI cache, we have response times between two and five milliseconds here. Uh, so web request comes in, uh, hits Nginx, forwarded to PHP. With fast CGI cache in action, uh, we see that the first web request that's coming in still lasts around uh, three milliseconds, and uh, here the same execution, not from a transaction flow, but from a tree perspective. So web request coming in on Nginx and hitting PHP, uh, index PHP. The other requests that come in are much faster, so around three milliseconds faster, and don't uh, hit the PHP engine at all. And it could even uh, be in a way that the fast process manager could be shut down completely as soon as it's found in cache, it's taken from there. Um, so actually, this uh, performance gain of three milliseconds, so from 3.4 to 0 0.4 milliseconds, is actually just the communication. So imagine if the the code is more complex and takes 200 milliseconds in executions here, the cached content will would still be that fast. Another cool caching mechanism that we can use here is memcached. So on the one hand, uh, from, from uh, the, the PHP side, we could either store uh, complete HTML contents or parts of our uh, page in, in a memcached server, or what I'm doing a lot for, for several projects, I store data structures in memcached. So I have background processes running in PHP that uh, get data from a MySQL database with complex queries and prepares uh, data structure structures in a JSON format and store these data structures in memcached with a certain uh, URI key. Um, to access these data uh, through a web request from the browser, we don't need to implement uh, a certain access logic here in PHP. We can do that from uh, Nginx directly. So similar to what we have with the fast CGI pass where we forward the request to a fast process manager, we have a memcached pass where we forward a request that's coming in to the memcached server. So uh, in that case, if we get a web request with data news get list, for instance, that would be automatically forwarded to memcached with that URI, uh, memcached host running on port 11 to 11. If it's not found there, so when we get a 404 back, for instance, we go to our not in cache location, and in that case, we would forward the request to our PHP engine uh, available on that socket. So it's, it's a very cool mechanism here that we can use to access data directly from memcached. Um, with a, again, very basic PHP file, echo hello world, uh, I have created uh, some, some tests here. So 5,000 requests with a concurrency of 100 with Apache and PHP that took uh, 7.2 seconds in total. With Nginx and PHP it took 4.6 seconds and with memcache we were down to, to three seconds. Again, for that very basic uh, PHP script. 
Um, static content caching uh, can also be done very easily by setting an expiration header, just adding one line here to the location block, expires in that case a year, and that sets the header automatically then. What I'm also doing uh, most times for, for uh, requests for the static contents to turn logging off, so on the one hand access logging, error logging, not found logging, turn it completely off, it also saves a lot of time in the execution of, of these requests. Uh, file handle caching is something that's a little more sophisticated then. Um, what Nginx is doing here is it keeps the file handles from uh, the uh, worker processes to the file system open for uh, static files that are requested uh, high frequently. Uh, in that case, we instruct Nginx to keep the file handles open if we have uh, at in a minimum five uses of that file and then keep it valid for uh, 60 seconds. Um, what we saw before a couple of times is that I used on the one hand uh, as a name or an IP address here in the fast CGI pass or in a memcached pass or on the other hand I'm using named uh, upstreams like in that case PHP and this is an upstream name that is predefined. Uh, I can either just define one server here or on the other hand if I define multiple servers then I automatically have a load balancer. So what Nginx is doing here when it sends requests to PHP it, it uses that upstream block and it sends the first request to that server, next request to that server and uh, uses a, a round uh, robin mechanism here. We can define weights so for uh, performance servers we can send five requests to first server, two requests to the next server, one request to the third server and the fourth server would only be used as a backup if no other servers are available. Uh, by the way, uh, we do not only have these fast CGI pass or memcached pass, we also have a standard option of a, of a proxy pass for instance, where we can forward uh, on the one hand standard HTTP requests and on the other hand uh, what's uh, in implemented I think in version 1.9.0 is uh, standard TCP load balancing. So we can actually load balance everything that's uh, coming in in a TCP traffic. Especially with Nginx Plus we also can use uh, other uh, methods here, not only round robin but also the least connected so it automatically checks where least connections are open and new requests are sent to that server. And we also have different options for session persistence. Uh, for the open source version of Nginx, we have IP hash available. So as in this example, when we get a web request in, it checks where the web request is coming from and always sends requests from a certain IP address to the same upstream server. So if we have uh, multiple PHP servers in the background and we are not using session storage like Redis to have uh, a centralized session storage, if we are using still file storage there, that would still work as we always send uh, requests to the same backend server and we have the session information available. Um, I've recently added some, some information here because uh, in, the, in the last uh, versions of, of Nginx uh, some new cool stuff has been added and uh, at the Nginx conference in 2000 September, uh, 2015 in September this year, they, they announced a couple of, of cool stuff. On the one hand, it's uh, the HTTP2 support, uh, which can be easily activated just by adding the HTTP2 uh, directive in the listening block. Uh, the only thing that has to be made sure here is that the, the speedy parameter is, is removed because these two modules 
would not work together. And even though Nginx would, uh, the, the HTTP2 in Nginx itself would work without uh, SSL certificates, communication would not work because all the existing browsers that are out there and support HTTP2 uh, require SSL certificates for the HTTP2 communication. Engine script, who has heard about engine script? No one? Uh, engine script is actually uh, a new way of adding logic to the Nginx configuration files. Uh, and Nginx is a, is a Java script engine that has to be implemented by uh, Igor himself, actually. Uh, he, he said in his announcements, uh, he, he said he, he tried all the existing uh, engines, so the mostly the V8 engine from Google, and they are not bad engines, but they are really optimized for uh, usage in the browser. But this is something that should run on the server, uh, similar to Node.js. On, on the other hand, Node.js is using Google's V8 engine, but uh, Igor decided to, to implement his own JavaScript engine. And it's a way, so you have uh, different options here in adding JavaScript functionality to the configuration file. On the one hand, to use code to set certain variables that can be used later on in the configuration. On the other hand, really to define a GS run uh, where certain code is executed and response objects can, do, can be accessed directly from JavaScript and also be, mo be modified here. So in that case, uh, we, uh, the dollar $R is the request and the response of that is uh, the response object. We set the status, the HTTP response code. Uh, send hello world and response finish, so that would complete the web request here. Uh, I won't go through that. Uh, you would have my, you will have my slides available later on. Uh, if you're interested in that, there is some some more uh, complex code here on how JavaScript in Nginx can be used. Another thing they are currently working on, it's not yet released, but uh, should be soon, is dynamic modules. So currently, uh, custom modules are available for Nginx, but they have to be uh, compiled uh, with the binary. The new approach is that uh, these modules can be loaded dynamically. Uh, on the one hand, uh, for the open source version, uh, version any uh, module for Nginx Plus, these modules have to be certified by Nginx first, and only if they are digitally signed modules, then they can be loaded into Nginx Plus. Uh, the migration from existing modules to the new approach of dynamic modules uh, will not be that complicated, at least that's what they promised. Uh, we will see how it works out in detail, but I'm sure they, they find a cool way here. Um, yeah, well, uh, when I first started using Nginx, the main reason was actually uh, because uh, a couple of years back, everybody was talking, uh, it's such a fast, cool web server. Uh, now I'm, I've actually, I'm actually using it in, in all my projects, not just because it's fast, but also because it's of the way uh, configurations are created. Uh, the first, w when I first changed from Apache to Nginx, it was a little complicated to think in these uh, location blocks. But once you're used to it, it's actually, uh, yeah, much more straightforward uh, to to think in that way of of, of defining uh, configurations of, of confining the the structure of your application. Uh, but still, uh, yeah. One couple of words on, on performance. Uh, I mentioned before, it's, it's important to consider performance not only on a web server, not only in PHP, not only implement caching 
in PHP or not only do proper monitoring in the, in the database. It's really important to consider it from the user's perspective and uh, to see all the way down where is my bottleneck, where is my hotspot, where is uh, potential for uh, improvements here. And uh, I'm, I'm using some, some tools here. Uh, on the one hand, for all my, my tests that I do, mostly use Apache Benchmark uh, as a load generator or Selenium GMeter. Uh, and so all of these tools are actually free, especially Firebug, Google Developer Tools, and uh, Dynatrace, uh, the company I'm working for, we also have some uh, cool free tools here. On the one hand, uh, our Dynatrace HX edition is a tool for the browser that does the monitoring from there. And uh, from the server side, uh, we also have, on the one hand, a 30-day free trial and a free personal license for developer. This, this is generally free. and can really do uh, performance analysis in your application, seeing what's starting, what's happening in the browser, what's going to the web server, what's happening there, what's going on in PHP, what's going on in the database. So not only uh, is a problem in PHP, but also go down to code level and, and go down to module level in Drupal, for instance, to see where are actually my performance hotspots. Um, well, that's it from my side. If there are any questions, please feel free. Yeah. Uh, yes, I will put my slides on SlideShare. And uh, you have my uh, wrong key. This is my, my 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 Twitter account. I, I will uh, send it out a tweet once they are available, but should be later this afternoon. Uh, you found my slides available then, as I said on SlideShare. Sure. So everybody understood the question, or should I repeat it? You heard it. Uh, I'm not aware of any collaboration here. Uh, HT access uh, is something that's, that's really uh, Apache specific. So there is no such thing as a Nginx uh, HT access interpreter. There are some tools for conversion uh, to convert HT access into Nginx configurations, but these only work for, for basic stuff, not for complex. I would not recommend to use these tools. Uh, for uh, changed security uh, features in Drupal that are implemented in HDXs, I'm not aware uh, that there is any collaboration with, with the teams. <laughs> 